welcome to this week's Swarf and Chips. Now, Gio, I'm honoured to be in your company because, well, I know you've received a lot of abuse already so far, <laughs> but you are the new boy in town, aren't you? I am, Lindsay. It's been an amazing few weeks. Welcome back as well, Thank and congratulations you. on the baby. Thank you. Now, what's going to happen in this week's Swarf and Chips? Well, this week's Swarf and Chips, we're at Seco inspiration through innovation event and we're at star and we're also at the keating uh, looking at this keating supercars up at university in bolton brilliant enjoy the show mark the inspiration through innovation event at seco what's it all about well we're on the second day I've been here for many years, and this is the busiest one I've been to, but when you've got big machine tool companies, you've got all the integrators. As an engineer, why would you not actually come to this event when you've got everything for your shop floor? It's an absolutely fantastic event. Brilliant, and it has been busier, like you say, year on year, so hopefully, fingers crossed, 2018, it's going to be bigger. Can it get bigger? Well, they might need to build something different here, but hey, if you haven't booked a date for next year, get the dates from Seco, you should come here. Brilliant, thank you. Simon, here today at Seaco at the Inspiration Through Innovation event. Tell me a little bit about this event and why you're here. Well, I think it's so fantastic that you've got so many different partners and different technologies under one roof. It's almost like a mini exhibition. It's absolutely fantastic. I've noticed this BMW demo behind us. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that, please? Yeah, sure. Um, it really is uh, an example of the type of quality that you can achieve with a powerful cam system such as Hypermill. So Swarf and Chips this week, Paul, we're trying to find new technologies. We're here, obviously, at Seco's Inspiration Through Innovation. What have you brought along from Romy? Uh, we brought our new D800 hybrid machine, which is an additive subtractive machining centre. So I know the D800 machine, I've looked at it many times. Is this the same as that when it comes to the subtractive part of the machining? Yeah, it's a standard D800 and then we add the additive hybrid manufacturing technology to the machine. I'm going I'm to act like a real layman here, but where does the additive sit? Where is it in the tool chain? in the tool mount or? Uh, it can be both. Um, basically we can have a tool changeable head that you can put away into the carousel or this machine's got a fixed duct that basically once the spindle retracts the, the additive head comes into play. Hi oh, Scott, we're at the Inspiration Through Innovation event here at Seco. Your partners with Willemann McCodal um, and you've brought out Fusion, this new technology. Can you tell me a little bit about this please? Yeah, basically we take um, recycled CO2, so CO2 is a waste product of other industrial applications. Uh, we harness it, we recycle it, and we use it to replace your traditional water and oil-based emulsions. I know you like to watch Swarf and Chips on a Friday night, Mark, with your glass of port and cheese, don't you? <laughs> I certainly do, actually. I quite often sit at home and watch it during the day, but don't tell Roger. <laughs> now, on this Matsura machine that you brought here to the Seco event, why would engineers be attracted to it? What are they going to see today? Um, well, Matsura have brought out the MX330 to follow in the success of the MX520. Um, the 330 offers our unrivaled, unmanned operation that you get from some of the large machines, the MAM72 range, but at a much lower cost. So if you're just if you're a small, relatively small company just trying to get into automation, then the Matsura with automation standard is ideal because we get the benefits of being able to monitor the machine from a tool, a pallet and a schedule perspective so that it just will run and run and run. Darren, we're here at the Inspiration Through Innovation event here at Seco today. I want to ask you an important question. What are you doing on Friday apart from watching Coronation Street? Playing tennis. Darren, that's not what we wanted. What do you do on a Friday? Swarf and chips. Daniel, Saturday mornings, yeah. given the choice between Soccer AM and Swarf and chips, what's on your yeah, TV? Swarf and chips all day long. Perfect. Yeah. That's all I need. No. We're here at the event at the uh, Inspiration Through Innovation. Geo Kingsbury have got a big presence here. You've got, you've got, is it four Hermely machines in this cell? Hermely machines, yeah. And you're not only just doing a demonstration, but you actually manufacture here as well for Seeker. Yeah, so they, um, all, all the machines in this area are, are purchased for custom tool manufacture. When it comes to the weekend and Friday approaches, what will you be doing on that Friday? Geo, there's nothing I like better than to kick back and watch Swarf and Chips. Ben, most engineers know Renishaw. We're at the Seco event here. Now you're working with Anchor on this automation uh, process here, but tell us a little bit more. 
So what we got here, this is uh, a cell that we've been uh, doing in collaboration with Anchor. Uh, this cell is actually traveling the world at the moment. So it started out in Australia, it's moved on to Emo Hanover. Now it's here in the UK at the Seco event. It's then going on to Detroit to another important industry event. What it's showing is uh, a, an example of how aerospace components, in this case a sample blade uh, with a sample root form on it, can be ground on one of their grinders lifted out with robots, placed into various other devices, including the equator gauging system. Now, if you thought the technology was good, check out the lunch. Hey, Jacob, we're here at Seco today. Uh, what an amazing event. Tell me a little bit about this machine, please. Right, what we've got here is a Fanuc Robo Drill, which is a vertical machining centre, a 21 tool indexer, and it's got a DDRT on there. Brilliant. And on a Friday, um, apart from going to the pub, what do you enjoy doing? Well, as I say, I don't really get to go out to the pub very often anymore. Girlfriend keeps me in. So mostly I just force her to watch Swarf and Chips. Thank you, please. OK, so Factory Wiz is live data monitoring of your machine shop. It's not restricted to CNC's, we can monitor all sorts of machines. And is this for large machine shop, small machine shop? This can start at a small machine shop with one machine, or big machine shops with 100 machines. Danny, the multi-face from Tame, can you tell me a little bit about this new product please? Yeah, of course I can, yeah. So this is a product uh, designed and manufactured in-house uh, in our factory down in Long Prendon near uh, Aylesbury. Um, it is designed to fit as many parts on the machine as, as you can get. So this is our multi-phase three. You can fit three parts on your five-axis machine while still getting at all five faces uh, use, using the Lang work holding system. And how does this mount to the machine bed? Um, so, I mean, most of our customers have already got a quick point plate, which is drilled to fit onto the, the bed of the machine. So this has uh, the Lang studs in, so you can just drop it straight onto, onto that. And it accommodates for all sizes of Lang centric grippers? Yeah, exactly. So we've got three, three different vice widths, and uh, the, the one part is designed so that you can put any of our vice widths onto, uh, onto that, um, you know, just bolt it straight up in. Uh, yeah, I came last year. Um, I'm thoroughly impressed with what I saw, the amount of people are here. Um, contact the guys at Seco, uh, mention what I wanted to do, shown them the product, um, they were absolutely buzzing with it, um, and yeah, here we are. So, Richard, you've had a very busy day, I've finally been able to grab hold of you. How has the show been? Well, it's been great. It, it's been really, really great. You know, the numbers again are, are up. And uh, and I think there's a lot of there's a there's a real buzz in the place and, and there's a lot of happy people out here. So yeah, I, I think we're really really pleased with it. And why would you feel? Why would you kind of recommend people to come to this event over the likes of Emo? Okay, that is a great question, and um, hopefully I've got a great answer for it. <laughs> but because you know it's born out of you know us being at Mac, us being at Emo, and doing all those things, and there are there is a place for those. those. But you know, at the end of the day, you could also, as a manufacturer, end up at a show every week. And, and, and one of the things that we really, really don't want this just to be is a two-day exhibition where, you know, we're a bit like a supermarket and people come with their brands and they put them on the shelf and they display everything around their brand. That, that's fine and there's a place for that. But actually, this is about really intimacy and coming together in a much smaller environment, a closer environment, where we actually, we don't just kind of display the brands separately in silos on the shelf, so to speak, to use a supermarket analogy, but we actually really demonstrate what's possible when you really really work together with a customer at the center so it's really about closeness to the customer it's about manufacturing technologies really coming together wrapping ourselves in clusters in the demonstrations that we've been running over the days um, so that's kind of all of the main ingredients for manufacturing environment because I think if you look into manufacturing you don't have to look far to find actually there's a real skill shortage Pretty much every company you go to, there's a real shortage of skills. And, you've, and, and, and in one of those bottlenecks is a manufacturing engineer. And that manufacturing engineer, he, he, he's, he's, he's almost got to be like Jesus. <laughs> because he has to come in, he has to look at you know, the effectiveness and the efficiency in a factory. He's also then got to deal with you know, five, six, maybe ten tooling companies, similar number of machine tool companies, similar number of uh, CAD CAM companies, metrology and inspection, and do all of the other things. Well, it's almost impossible for that guy. 
So I have, I have a belief deep down that actually the future belongs to those that collaborate. And then for us as technology partners, if we do that for the customer, without saying, you know, that's all your responsibility, Mr. Customer. If we take the initiative and we show what's possible when we work together, then we can really make a game changer. So that's what this is about. Wow, what a day yesterday was. The events keep coming thick and fast. Today is the turn of Star GB. Yes, I'm here at their headquarters in Derby. I'm going to meet with Matt, who's one of the area sales managers, and he's going to tell me some of the highlights that are on show here uh, this week at one of the UK's leading sliding head lathe suppliers. And Colin and Gio are here, and they're going to be talking to some of the partners that are also exhibiting at the event. Richard, here we are at the Star Open House. What a great event. Yes, it certainly is. I come here every year with my team. We've been uh, really lucky that in the last two years they've allowed us to have a permanent display here so we can uh, bring and introduce new products, not only to people at the Open House, which is very important, but to all the guests that visit during the year. I'm, I'm surprised with your product range and, and how extensive it is. Can you... Can you um Give us a little bit more information on what you do, please. Absolutely, Gio. The range of tools we now provide to support sliding head machines and fixed head machines in this industry has diversified immensely over the last five to 10 years. Once upon a time, a collet and a bush and a few tools was all that was required. And now we're dealing with very high performance milling applications, high performance drilling applications, uh, high pressure coolant feed systems to provide the best productivity performance for their machines. Finally, just to round up, what do you do on a Friday, Richard? Well, actually, I enjoy a nice plate of fish and chips by my mum and dad. But that's only after I've enjoyed swap and chips. <laughs> Matt, one of the highlights at this show this week is this model, which is the SR20J2. Now, it's obviously um, superseding a previous model, isn't it? What was the previous model? So the SR20J is the previous model, so we had it in two versions. So. Type C, which was a guide brush machine, and a Type N, which was a non guide brush machine. You couldn't go between the two. And now, with this model, with it being the Type B, the J2 Type B, you can go between guide brush and non guide brush. Yeah, that's correct. So we've got a Type A as well, which you can do the same. It's just differences in number of tools on the back end. All right, if you t forget in the guide brush and non guide brush element for a minute, what, what else is different with this new model? Well, a lot more weight in the casting, so we can do a lot heavier machining. There's a bit more speed in the power tools as well. Uh, more power on the sub spindle. And what speed are the power tools? 8,000 RPM. And then the main spindle and the sub spindle? They're both the same, so they're 10,000 RPM, 3.7 kilowatts on both main and sub spindle. So the other thing, you've got a lot more power on the sub spindle compared to the old version. So where, where, where's the, uh, the, the new market for this, or is it the same as the old market, but just with a, a heavier machine and a faster machine? So it's uh, replacing the existing machinery out there, but it's also for new customers coming into siding head territory, that's given a machine that's got a lot of tools, a lot of power, you can do a lot of work. I mean, it may, may sound like a very straightforward question, but more tools basically means you can do more operations. Does it mean you can do more operations at once? Absolutely. More complex jobs are achievable. You know, in some of the machines we had in the past, you had to be clever about how you did the machining. Now you can do a lot more work easier. And where are those extra tools? Because to me, it looks like you've got quite a lot on, on the back working spindle now as well. That's great. We've got more tools on the back end on this machine. It's the old version, you only have four. So now on this particular model, we've got eight. So it gives you quite a huge significant difference in your number of tools. We've got another version, we've got six, so you're still more than the old version, depending on what kind of work you're doing. So this machine is a 20 mil bar machine. Is, is this the, your most popular selling size of uh, sliding head lathes? Yes, the 20 millimeter range is our biggest seller. Uh, we've got a lot of customers that use the size, and with this new machine here, they can do a lot more, they can do jobs faster than before. What about fire suppression and things like that? Do these sorts of things come standard with these machines? Yes, yeah, fire suppression standard. We normally fit the fire trace system as standard. Uh, we'll see it on all the machines in here. Uh, so customers don't have to worry about that. <laughs> and, and I bet when your customers turn up now, I bet one of the things, if they're impressed with the technology in the machine and the enhancements, they're going to ask you, is there a premium to pay on the price? How do you answer that question? Well, you're paying for a slightly higher technology machine. You've got more tools, so you'll be able to do jobs that are a bit easier, a bit faster. So yes, it's going to be a little bit more than the old version, but you're getting a lot more machine for your money. And when you uh, you cover the southwest, I believe, correct? When you're in the southwest, I know you win a lot of orders, don't you, against your competition? Does this machine mean you're going to win even more? 
I'd like to think so, yeah. It gives me the edge. Richard, what do you do on a Friday? Watch Swarf and Chips. What, what else would you do on a Friday? Simon, here we are at the Star Open House. I've got a big question for you, Simon. What do you do on a Friday? Well, I'm going to grab a beer and I'm going to watch uh, Swarf and Chips. Spot on. Adrian, here we are at the Star event. What a fantastic event. Yeah, absolutely. A uh, cracking event, which we're very, very happy to support. You, you're bringing out some new tools? Yep, a uh, complete range of products now to support sliding head lathes. Fantastic. Looking forward to hearing about them. What do you do on a Friday, Adrian? Well, after a hard week at the Star Open House, I have to go home and watch uh, Swarf and Chips. So we move on to the, this machine, which is the SW20 here, Matt. Now, primarily I want to talk about HFT. So first tell us what HFT is uh, for our viewers and what it's doing on this machine. Okay, so the HFT is a software package that we can install onto the machine. Basically, you know, it's getting materials that are generally stringy swarf to chip. So for all those companies that are using uh, 316, 304 stainless, your plastics, for instance, where your tools get tangled up, this software basically gets the tools. Is it a common problem? Yes. Well, it's not many customers I talk to, so I'm, I've got a problem with uh, you know, swarf control. And that's basically what we've got here, swarf control is what it's all about. Right, and, and is it, is it a so, it's totally in software, so you just put it onto the control on the machine, yeah? Yes. And is it easy to, to put onto the machine, to interface or to, to add to it? It depends on uh, the age of the control. But on the newer machines, it's a lot easier, and it's just a simple M code to switch it on and an M code to switch it off. And how long has it been available to star users? Only a couple of months. So, how many of you already got using it? A lot, and existing customers are wanting it for their older machines straight away. It's really important that the perception of engineering in the UK needs to change. Why are you part of this? Uh, we're here this week at Star at Open House promoting a cleaner working environment. So showcasing our products to make sure you can have a cleaner working environment in your machine shop because that has changed over the years. So from a health and safety perspective, environmental perspective, and also to, to, to draw the, young, the best young talent into yeah. the industry. Oh, that's correct, because you just don't want this dirty working environment. This oil clouds going, if you open the machine tool centers, it goes into the engineering workshop, goes onto the floors, goes, and it's respiratory, they breathe it in, which isn't nice over a long period of time. So they're cleaning up their act for cleaner, safer, more productive workshops. And it's good for everyone. Fundamentally, it's good for everyone. It is, yeah, and you're bringing this new generation through, which I think everyone's getting more passionate about nowadays. Matt, just to round up, um, what do you do on a Friday? <laughs> Work hard. <laughs> And I, I can't even say. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, we've done a road trip. We're up in Bolton. We saw this place. We thought, what an amazing place to stop in and have a look around. It's phenomenal. It's an engineer's dream. So we pounced on Mark, who's faculty director. Is that correct? Correct indeed, yeah, for the NACME facility, which has just opened up for this new semester. And what's the actual facility called? It's the National Centre for Motorsport Engineering, right. based at Bolton University. Glad you said that, because I kept getting it wrong. Now, Don't worry. This, this car here, first of all, I think this is your baby, isn't it? It is indeed, yeah. I built this car. Well, I bought it when I was 12 years old. I've rebuilt it about six years ago. So it's a historic sporting trials car, eligible for historic sporting trials championship, which is a new championship started about four years ago. And it's for people to go off-roading. So this car will go up any muddy slope, and the furthest man wins. Fair enough. And, uh, you don't just walk the walk, you talk the talk, because you actually manufacture, you built some parts in here? Uh, yeah, I mean, the whole car was constructed and built by myself. Very impressive. Now, let's move on to the ne next one. Now, this I've got eyed up for my next car. It's a Buras Barus. I keep getting it wrong. The Sorry, Keating guys. Supercar, it's the Barus, which is their new model, yep. which we're working in conjunction with Keating Supercars here at the university to create the prototype car, which we'll see when we go down okay. the facility. And so, what speeds are going to get to? <laughs> well, it's going to be sort of 190, 200 mile an hour supercar. Not bad. And what's, what's this here? Right, this is an Aquila Synergy. We use this with the students, so this gives the students the interaction of fundamental chassis work at a track. So they'll understand this particular car, they're putting a load of data systems on it to do data logging, so they will understand basic functions and systems and understand how to read that, and that obviously goes through with their courses. Uh, great, great stuff. So let's 
move on to the next next sort of showroom, really. Yeah. This sort of beats a local VW showroom. No disrespect to VW, of course, but yeah. what's this car here? Right, so we've got several things in here. This particular car is, again, a Keating supercar. This car had the land speed record for a petrol engine car until 2009. And that is really the ethos of the Keating relationship with the university, to try and attain and get that credibility to build a production supercar that will obviously attain these sorts right. of speeds. What's the, the next? The, um, this is a Ginetta G40, so this is used for um, the student's experience to try and understand fundamental engineering principles of a car. And it's also the type of car that is used um, in British touring car support races. So you can actually drive this in a race at the age of 14. Oh, right, fantastic. And then now sort of recognise this from the weekend's racing. Yeah, so this is last year's Manor Formula One car. Um, the team's no longer functional, so we've taken this as a project to basically for the students to understand aerodynamics at the highest possible level. Obviously, Formula One is the pinnacle of the motorsport, so this is showing the aerodynamic sort of trends from last year. Right. And then the final car in the showroom? Yeah, well, this one is a really unique car. It's personal to me. I was actually a team manager for the Nissan team back in the day in 98 and 99. This is a 97 car, and it's really showing touring cars at its best. When touring car budgets were beyond control and manufacturers were spending way, way too much money. But it shows the amount of engineering that was going into what was basically a saloon car championship for a national championship and the money that was spent and the investment. And it's really good for the students to get close up to that and just seeing how level and how sophisticated the cars are. Yeah, it really is. But, it, you know, we've got these fantastic cars here, but it's also about getting sort of down and dirty because you've actually got some machine shops. So why don't we go and have a look at those? Of course, no problem. Mark, we're in the machine tool room here. You've got your Haas your XYZ, but they don't look like sort of the state that are full five axis machines that you might expect. No, they're not, but they're very suitable for what we want to give the students as an experience. And obviously they're, they're simple and straightforward to use and they're good for the interaction with the students. And we're fortunate with the Bruce project that the students are obviously exposed to the CAD design element. They can assist on that process, then take from CAD directly come across to the machines witness the bits that they've designed or had a hand in being made, and then walk them from the machine through to the production area, whereby they can actually see the parts being fitted to the car. Right, so they can actually see their own results. But it's great testament to these machines and what they can do. It, yeah, indeed it is. I mean, it's perfect. And it's perfect for the environment we're working in. Okay. Now, next section, I know Gio's waiting to have a chat with you in the composite room. Correct, yeah, no problem. We should go through there. Yep. Mark, we're in the composites department here, and we've got the vacuum oven behind us. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this, please? Yeah, indeed. Well, first and foremost, the size is obviously quite large, and the purpose for that is you can get a whole car monocot into it if you're required to do so. And in essence, it's just like your domestic oven at home, so it goes to a high temperature, but also it has a vacuum pump attached, and there's a manifold inside it. So whatever you are making will be in a vacuum bag, and it will be drawing it down onto the mold to make sure it conforms before it cures itself in the oven. And we can see what we've got, some examples around here of doing that around the corner. Thank you. Mark, here are a couple of examples of the carbon fibre before curing and after curing. Can you explain to me how this process works, please? Yeah, indeed. So um, we have the carbon fibre comes as a sheet, a bit like wallpaper, but that's pre-impregnated um, with the material needed to cure it. So that, in essence, is ready to go. So that is formed into the mold, which that's set on. This is actually a seat buck for the Bruce project. So that will be formed. And then you put a vacuum bag onto it. Once the vacuum bag's on it, it then goes into the oven. The vacuum will draw it in so it fits the mold perfectly. The heat process will cure it off. And then it comes out like this. This is actually a door card. And you can see the finished article of a very solid, strong piece of shiny carbon fiber. And am I right to, in the understanding of that these can be um, made to different tensile strengths. Um. So you can, you can change, the, 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 what's possible is endless. The number of plies you use, the type of material you use, how you fix it together, whether you add any honeycomb into it. And it really is, it's a, it's a science in its own right to understand what the product is, whether it's an aesthetic part, whether it's a structural part, whether it has to have some deformation in it, as it's a crash structure or anything. So the design of that is a, a very, very big part of it. And obviously the layup is, and, and in, in essence, everything is a hand-built part. So they're all built up as a number of plies and go together. And obviously then the destructive testing comes in to make sure it's fit for purpose afterwards. So application specific, each component, and also 
can you tell me a bit about the repeatability of the, 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 the manufacturing of the carbon fiber components, please? Yeah, I mean, repeatability, um, providing you follow the same science and follow the same method process, it will be the same, using the same supply of the raw material, the same layout procedure, and the same curing time, therefore the parts should be the same. If you do get it wrong, then obviously you could have a problem with the manufacturing process where it could fail. Mark, we're now looking at the back end of the Barus sports car. Um, the anodized components here are manufactured from Dukewell. Um, can you um, tell me a little bit more about these components, please? Yeah, I mean, in essence, the, the, there's an amalgam of two types of manufacturing process with the Bruce. So we've got traditional uh, tube steel fabrication, and then obviously the machined parts which come through, as you've already described. So the element at the moment, we're actually putting these onto the car and integrating and doing the prototype build. So it's basically putting the fabricated and the machine parts together, making sure the interaction is correct, and obviously fi fi final fitting everything up. Oh, fantastic. And we mentioned earlier um, that the students at the university are going to start manufacturing the components and they'll be working in conjunction with Dukewell, um, which I think is fantastic because it, theoretically, um, and practical skills uh, are essential nowadays. Yeah, indeed. I mean, I think it's vital to understand that when you graduate as an engineer, it's all well and good having the prowess and understanding for the mathematics and the physics and the practical side of it, or the, and the engineering side of it. But the practical side is often misunderstood. So the guys are actually getting the chance to get up close here, to do their own machining, to be involved in the fabrication process, to understand the welding and how it all comes together. And that are all very important parts. So it takes the theory completely into practice to make sure that they understand it every step of the way down the process. And these students, in my opinion, are very fortunate to have this opportunity. I mean, when does the car get launched? Well, the car will be launched next year. The prototype car will be up and running before Christmas. So they are very lucky. And I wish, you know, when I was starting my time out, I got the opportunity of doing something like this. You know, all I had was a glorified kit car or a lawnmower or something. So this takes it to a whole new level. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Mark. You're probably welcome. Thank you for watching this week's Swarf and Chips. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. And if you want to watch any previous episodes, click on the links here. Next week, though, we have a major takeover show. Who's going to be there? Yeah, we've got a takeover show from Hymer. So whether it's cutting tools, work holding, balancing, presetting, they pretty much do it all. So yeah, next week, Hymer takeover. Can't wait. Yes, well, I know that they were at Emo. So shall we see what they've been up to before we meet them next week? So this is our enhanced dual lock line. So for the first, uh, for the first time, uh, dual lock. It's a patented modular system. Now it's available with uh, heavy, heavy metal extensions or solid carbide extensions, which have a steel part braced on it. And what dual lock really does, and why it's so revolutionary, it's the first modular system in the market that you can actually take the same kind of cuts than with a solid carbide. We have a real world premiere. We show for the first time our new digital touchpad and networkability of our shrink fit machine. We call these series I 4.0, stands for Industry 4.0 uh, series. So that's the future in shrink fit that you can have it connected to a network of your tool management library. You can easily operate them by a scanner so it gets even easier to actually operate them. And it has two types of cooling available. So uh, our well-proven contact cooling system in the premium series and in the so-called sprint series, that's a new uh, cooling capability in terms of a contour independent cooling by a air and water mist actually that cools down the holder effectively independently of the outer contour of the shrink fit holder. Uh, work here in the tool management room of um, our booth and even if it looks like a booth, it's a real tool management room, is how the tool management room of our company in Germany looks like. So it should be like this in every single production and if you come to Germany to see Heimer, it will look like this the very same way, as lean as clean as we're showing here. We have uh, multi-purpose tools now available from the basic mill which is very universal in terms of high class performance at an entry level price with a great competitiveness in the market actually.